But, okay, so this talk is Mentoring the Intelligent Deviant, What Special Ops and the InfoSec Communities Can Learn from Each Other. And our speakers are Nina Collars and Paul Brister. Thank you. Oh, oh, the end of the trail. All right, that was it. Sorry. We, we know next year if we get in, we'll buy additional love with another liter and a half bottle of booze. Um, okay. Wow, I didn't think we ran out that fast. Um, at least I have some. Okay, I have my own. All right, so we're going to start. Um, we're not going to take up all of your time. I think we're just going to try and be succinct with what we're trying to say. So I'm Nina. I'm a political scientist. Um, I've been studying the hack community, your, your community, and increasingly I'm coming to feel like my family. Um, for the last few years, uh, working on a book project about national security and uh, security researchers like you guys. So um, ShmooCon was my first con ever. Um, I've been, this is my fifth ShmooCon now, and this is my very first ever talk at a con. And so I just want to say thank you. Thank you. I have a lovely family in the front row, and they uh, have been supporting it all along, and I was supposed to go to dinner with them last night, but I freaked out and didn't, uh, and just stayed home instead. So thank you for bearing with me. Um, love you, too. Um, so I'm currently at the Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island, um, and there, my other job, my day job, I'm a professor of uh, military innovation technology at the Strategic and Operational Research Department. And uh, my name is Paul Brister, uh, recently retired after a 20-year career uh, in the special operations community uh, where I got to visit uh, a lot of interesting places uh, and more importantly work alongside some of the most incredible human beings uh, that you could ever imagine working alongside. So we're legally required, um, just for those of you who've worked within the government before, that I do have to say the opinions expressed today do not represent the Department of Defense, the Naval War College, the Navy, or any associated defense institutions in the United States. And uh, I was also warned that any you know, malicious use of the term cyber resulted in a drink. I don't know why that's a deterrent. So cyber, 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 let's get it started. Cheers. All right, let's talk about deviants. All right, so um, the thing about deviants, you, this is not a technical talk. Um, <laughs> the thing that's important to think about, which is that deviance is about difference, and difference is pretty important and pretty valuable when it comes to the uh, security research infosec space. Um, and so as I talk about deviance, I know that a lot of us flippantly, you know, sort of refer to it as criminality, but deviance um, actually has very strong roots in innovative thinking. And so when you combine somebody with an engineer's skill set, some of those basic skills and a deviant mind, yeah, yeah, th things break, right? Things break all the time, but you also get new ideas, new pathways, new thought patterns. And so the problem is, what do you do with brains that think that structures are to be questioned or experimented with or tested? Um, I've been watching you all for years now, um, and I think that as, as I look at this now only vaguely sober crowd, um, I see a lot of deviance, right? Um, goodness comes from deviance, but deviance also needs guidance, and that's a thing I think we want to talk about. Your challenge, or maybe our challenge, in uh, growing this community of intelligent deviance um, is to try and make them do more good than harm. So how do you do that? How do you keep a community healthy? Um, and how do you do that for an entire community at the same time? All right, so I'm not going to insult your intelligence and read off the screen, but I'd ask you to, to take a look uh, at the community profile on the screen. And what I'm hoping is that, that it hits really close to home, given the, uh, the profile of the crowd out there. And if it doesn't, this could be a tragic presentation going forward. <laughs> Now, I'm going to ask you to believe uh, that the definition you see on the screen applies equally well, if not better, to the United States Special Operations community. And first, I'm going to ask you to believe that the Special Operations community is often poorly represented in the media, and that the typical soft operator, that Special Operations Force operator, does not approach the hyper-heroic Rambo character that's often portrayed. I've found that the community is probably the most intelligent, the most deeply critical, and surprisingly, deeply empathetic community that, uh, that exists in the military. For those that don't understand the, the special operations community, uh, we have a bifurcated mission, uh, two different roles. 
the most publicly represented role uh, on one side of the river uh, are those that uh, are often portrayed in the media. Uh, it's, it's the ones that we are associate with something we call surgical strike operations. Uh, those are the hostage rescues, the direct action commando raids, anything hyperkinetic that requires a high degree of surprise in and out very quickly uh, while maintaining an element of surprise. The other side of our operations falls under an umbrella that we call special warfare. Uh, these are activities that often take years to develop. Uh, building and training foreign forces, conducting humanitarian operations, conducting civil affairs, conducting information operations. If we're successful in the special warfare arena, uh, we've hopefully prevented violence from outbreaking. Uh, and I would argue that it's, it's our most important but least publicized uh, role within the community. Now, being proficient at both simultaneously requires an extremely talented human. It shouldn't surprise you that our, tra our training pipelines a trip between 70 to 90% of the people uh, that begin training. Uh, as a personal example, I began with a class of 48 and finished with four. To succeed in the community, you have to be abnormal. You have to think differently, and you have to solve challenges differently. You get some extremely awesome humans, but they are extremely hard to lead and groom. So let me introduce you to the young deviant on your screen now, uh, and we'll return to him later uh, in, the, in the presentation as well. This young man's just finished high school and enlisted in the Air Force. His background is one of the Golden Gloves boxer. He's a part-time break dancer. Uh, yeah, I'm not kidding. Uh, and, he's, and he possesses an extremely curious, risk-seeking, active mind. In its infinite wisdom, the Air Force decided to make him a military policeman right off the bat. And then they decided to send him to the Philippines. Needless to say, this didn't work out extremely well, and within a couple years, he was on his way out of a military discharge. On his, way, on his way out, he ran into a, a special operations recruiter who offered him one last opportunity uh, and said, hey, if you're up to the challenge uh, and you want to play, I'll let you be the first there so you can save others' lives. Uh, and you'll hear more about his story here in a second. This is how many of my young operators, as, as I assume different levels of command, this is the story of the origins of many of my young operators. Uh, and I promise this particular one has a good ending. Yeah, he, he doesn't die. It's fine. Okay. I'm going to, just in case you thought this was going to be a tragedy, uh, it's not. We're, we're all, it's only 3.30. Okay. Um, so I want to talk a little bit now more about what I'm watching in the community and the kinds of things that I'm worried about for this sort of clan of deviants in front of me. Um, I hope to join you. I feel increasingly more like you, but I just want to, I want to tell you what I see on the outside and maybe that's helpful. Um, the community is under a great deal of pressure right now, and it isn't getting easier. Um, and in fact, I think probably last week's announcement from DerbyCon um, that this will be the last DerbyCon year is an indicator of um, just how much maybe the community needs to reflect and how um, maybe we need to start worrying about community health and figuring out how to, uh, how to keep it, keep it uh, vibrant while growing as fast as it is. There are three key points of pressure coming from the outside that are making it harder for this nest of deviants to continue being healthy together. Um, so I think of it in three ways, balance, professionalism, mission or money, and prestige and reputation. Um, they're not opposite each other, but just trying to find a good way to sort of check against the noxious stuff. So the first one, I worry about balance and professionalism. We're all aware that over the last couple of years, there's a million fly-by-night certifications. There's a ton of education systems out there that are interested in taking your money, their money, anybody new to the com uh, community's money, um, just to sort of get a certification out of it. Those people are new potential people to this clan. Uh, but they will have gone through these courses unaware of the socialization process, unaware of the core mission, unaware of the debates that you've been having for decades now. Um, that worries me because it's growing really fast. Some people don't like the growth of the CERT culture. Some don't like the growth of the classroom culture. Get a degree in two years in cybersecurity or infosec. I have to drink. Um, <laughs> sorry. It's not my fault. That's what they call the degrees. Um, so get, get this degree, right, and you'll be fine. You don't have to ever come into these halls or talk to these people, right? Um, the answer is actually not that there should be a bifurcation, but it's that this community, and I know you're already tired, um, has additional responsibilities. You've got a young clan of folks who are going through classes alone, who are coming out with degrees and have no idea how to do 
what it is you've grown up doing, right? That means that there's more responsibility, not less. You're not offloading this responsibility. You have to kind of figure out how to bring them in. I'm not saying it's easy. I just, this is just something I'm worried about. The second thing I think about is mission or money, and I think you guys know this tension pretty well. Um, it's not to say that you can't make money while doing the mission, that's not the truth, but that the money that it pays, the multiplication of vendors' contracts, and not to mention just the now and again temptation to play a little on the dark side, um, <laughs> right? Is, and there's money on that side, and so the question is, you know, what part of your heart is gonna stay true to the core, to the mission, and what part of you is gonna say, but I gotta pay the bills at the end of the day? Right? That's a real problem. Um, but it's also the case that there's a lot of playing on the dark side. And so just I'm trying to understand it in terms of the book, um, sort of as I build out my project, how many, how many people do you think play on the dark side that you're sitting next to? How many do you people think that, um, that, that, that your neighbors, your friends, your colleagues who, who are supposed to be doing white work are also doing dark work? Can I get a show of hands? I know people who play on the dark side. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right, so this is, the, this is the question, right? And so in the community, the surveys I've taken, about a third of you are doing it. Is that bad? Probably not healthy. Probably not healthy, but you're deviants, right? So we've got to figure out how to channel that. And then finally, I want to think about um, drawing a distinction between prestige and reputation systems. Both are prevalent in the community. Reputation systems help you uh, establish your credentials. They help you work in a team to get recognition for the work you're doing, for the research you're doing. It elevates you, helps you grow stronger. Right? That's what the community does, always has, internally. But there's also increasing pressure um, for prestige. Prestige is rock starism, wizardry, right? I'm the only one in the room who knows what I'm doing, right? And it makes it competitive and noxious to be in this community, especially for first timers, right? So how do you balance that inside the community? And by the way, that's an inside the community conversation. Because on the outside, People don't know the difference between that prestige rock star and someone who actually does good, solid work day to day, who works in teams and who's gonna do good things. All right, so those are my three challenges, and I'll turn it back over to him. All right, so when Nina first approached me about giving this talk, uh, I was highly skeptical that the, the, the challenges that your community faces are similar to the ones that, that the special operations community faced. Uh, but if you've been following the news lately, uh, the special operations community is suffering uh, of some, some, some ethical and moral slips and some of the things that we've done downrange. Uh, and it's also time for us to return to some of these fundamental challenges to rebalance our force. Uh, I'm not going to say that what we do can solve potential challenges in your community, but I'd ask you to, to consider uh, at least how we go about balancing uh, and understanding and maintaining a healthy community. Uh, so I talked to you about the bifurcated roles of the special operations community. I'd also like to talk to you about how we balance the responsibility, responsibilities of leadership. Uh, and please understand that within the special operations community, I don't care if you step in the door day one or you're at the end of a 20 to 30 year career, we consider you a leader. It's just you have different responsibilities within the organization to make sure that we have a healthy culture. Uh, for simplicity's sake, uh, we break down these three groups into graybeards, silverbacks, and sled dogs. Uh, so I see a couple of the Annapolis uh, colleagues sitting around here in the back. Uh, you may be pissed at me for saying this, but it's not the officer class that's going to take care of the health of the young deviants. Uh, I'd ask you to consider that. So. <laughs> yeah, the silverback, uh, the, uh, the, the graybeards. That, quaintly refers to the officer class, typically college educated, commissioned through some sort of uh, officer commissioning program, typically only sees three to four years over the course of a career on a battlefield uh, in terms of experience. Uh, what we expect of our officers is an up and out approach of the organization. Look downrange, look at the trends of the threats and make sure your unit's capable of meeting those. Uh, make sure you're financially sound, make sure all your administration's on time and make sure that uh, you set uh, a good culture. Most importantly for the young officers and young, young officers, ensure your credibility is high enough that you allow your young deviants and silverbacks to experiment and push the organization forward. The next group uh, I'll talk about is the sled dogs. Uh, these are our young deviants, our young junior enlisted, uh, whose only responsibility is to pull the sled. Uh, 
I, when I was in command, I only asked them, hey, I want you to focus on yourself. Increase your skills, increase your experience, and make sure we're heading in the right direction. Now, the last class uh, of leadership roles is by far the most important, and it's something that, that I'd, I'd like to focus on. That's the silverbacks. Those are our senior enlisted who now have grown up through the ranks, have between 8 and 20 years of battlefield experience, and have the reputational power to begin to shape the way the organization goes. I told you earlier the officer is responsible for looking up and out. The senior enlisted and the silverbacks are responsible for looking down and in and making sure of the health of the organization or the health of the community that they represent. Also moving on, uh, within the special operations community, we have five, five soft truths. Truth number one, and the one that I'd like to focus on, is human is more important than hardware. Uh, we believe this uh, goes beyond just the battlefield. We incorporate these into selection, education, training, professional development, and leadership roles. Now, transitioning to the challenge areas Nina talked about before, balanced professionalism, how do we manage it? Uh, so we have things called team rooms, massive rooms uh, that we call kind of the sanctuary of trust, and the motto of the team rooms is past these doors nothing. It's where our senior and junior enlisted get, get uh, a sit around a table at the end of the day, typically sipping beers, and they're able to critique each other ruthlessly. And once those doors open, all's forgotten. And if we do it right, it promotes the dialogue between the young bucks who just had this new technology and some of our silverbacks who've seen a thing or two in the world, and they inform each other. So please create some sort of sanctuary of trust among the older and younger generations where you can discuss these things. On mission or money, uh, if you know anything about Eric Prince and Blackwater, uh, we suffer the same issues as you do with defense contractors trying to pull some of our young talent away into overseas mission, more of the gray hat area uh, from our perspective. We haven't solved this, and it's still a huge challenge for us, but the best thing that we can do is get a, a young core early inculcate them with the sense of integrity and some of the core values that we hold dear uh, and hope that if they get recruited away, they make that defense contractor better uh, by maintaining that sense of integrity that hopefully we've either taught them or beat into them. Uh, and then when they come back, make sure that they understand those roles again. And on prestige or reputation, the special operations community is at our absolute best when we embody uh, the notion of the quiet professional. Uh, and as you probably noticed by the release of hundreds of I Shot Bin Laden books, we've been slipping away from that core fundamental truth. So again, we rely upon intense internal pressure to identify prestige-seeking behaviors, what we call spotlight rangers, early in someone's career, and we often publicly and ruthlessly dismiss those people young in their career to make sure prestige behavior doesn't take hold uh, and continue growing within the community. We've suffered a problem lately with all the demands downrange of trying to remove people from the community and we're probably going to pay for it for a couple years now because of the, the, the push to maintain a certain number. All right, so the end of, end of my story of this young deviant. Uh, started off on the left. Uh, this is how this st young deviant story ends. Uh, that's Chief Master Sergeant Dave Keaton, who I was honored to have as my senior enlisted advisor during, during my time in command. Uh, I actually think he's watching live streaming right now, so uh, what's up, yo-yo? Uh, the rash will disappear in a couple days, uh, so hang in there, brother. Uh, so as you can see by his freakishly huge ribbon rack uh, and badges that go over his shoulder, uh, the guy is a legit battlefield warrior. Uh, but, and what, what's telling about his personality is he hates wearing this stuff. Uh, you have to force him to put on this stuff, which tells you about how much he cares about prestige and, and, and self-looking. So if, I'm asking you if you take one thing from this, uh, you take that for the health of the community, somehow you need to find a way to replicate the silverback. Uh, the young people that are willing to transition from a sled dog into a silverback and assume responsibility for the culture uh, and health of the community. And it's not, it's not easy to do. Sled dogs only worried about themselves. 
gaining expertise, you're now trying to ask someone that's run as a sled dog for a long time to shift his focus and take care of a larger community. And when you get it and you get a good, awesome sled dog that, that's proven himself on the battlefield, it's immensely powerful. And then you also have to distance yourself from a, social, from a social perspective too. You can't hang out at the same parties as the sled dogs because you need to correct some of those behaviors. So it's problematic in trying to make that transition from a sled dog to a silverback. Uh, but it is the only thing and it's the most powerful thing within the special operations community that we've found to maintain a healthy culture. And when we get sick, it's because we don't have the silverbacks uh, that either have the bona fides or the, or the, the skill enough to maintain health. So, um, just as a final parting shot, um, it's not like these, these structures aren't in the community already, but I think they're often tacit, and I think they often go unrewarded. And so, we found this horrible photograph. We thought we would pay homage and say thank you to Bruce Potter for all the work that he does, that Shmu does, that the community does. We have a ton of things to say, and we're going to do the, the mirror version of this talk for the special operations community, where we teach them a little bit about what maybe they could do better. Um, diversity of opinion. Yeah. So, so on that, th again, this is my third ShmooCon, and to see the change in diversity, especially gender diversity, uh, even though you've still got quite a bit of work to do, uh, it's something that the soft community could learn from this community, and I wish you guys absolute success so we can take your example, pull it into our community, and replicate it. Uh, and we're about to get the shut the fuck up, so we're going to stop now. Thank you very much. Terrible photograph. <laughs>